I, I said, okay, sing it in front of me. Okay, sing it in front of me and your mom. Okay, sing it in front of me and the rest of the family. Okay, sing it in front of me and the family and the neighbors. I hope but, you say it a little softer for a girl. It's like, sing it! Sing it! <laughs> You can follow our next guest, of course, at Jocko Willink. His website is jockopodcast.com. It's an incredibly popular podcast. Last time he was on, we talked about uh, Extreme Ownership, of yes. which he's a co-author. His newest book, I want to make sure I get it, uh, is The Dichotomy of Leadership. Uh, he was a lieutenant commander of the U.S. Navy SEALs. I mean, the guy is just, you, you probably know who he is. Jocko, thanks for being back, sir. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I am very, look at this. Look at this. This is uh, our, our newest employee, actually, Smooth Manny, is a huge fan of yours, so I'll have some questions oh, yeah. from him. But he, I, he, I went in just the other day and saw just a stack of these. <laughs> yeah. And I said, is that... I'm on his desk. And I, said, just like, yeah, I said, is that, is that, does Jocko sell tea? He said, oh, yeah, it's a whole story because he doesn't drink coffee. And so now I, why don't you tell it to the audience, I guess, who doesn't, because I was entirely unfamiliar with this, but my apologies. So I guess maybe I'm a bad person because I'm super uh, particular about things in the world and the way I like things. And so I used to like to drink pomegranate tea, pomegranate white tea, as a matter of fact. I don't know why somebody gave it to me at some point. I really like the way it tastes. It's got, it doesn't have a ton of caffeine in it. So, so it doesn't make you all jittery. Yeah. Anyways, uh, eventually when I, when I, I was on Tim Ferriss's podcast and, and we were drinking pomegranate white tea. And so people kept asking, what kind do you drink? What kind, what kind is it? And I didn't really like any particular brand because they were all a little bit different and I didn't really love any of them. So I just made one that I really, really liked and put it out there and people started buying it. And then from there, I put it in cans because, you, you know, sometimes it's a kind of a pain to do the whole heating up water and putting a bag in it. Yeah. And have time for that. We're a busy so guy. Put, what with the Tim yeah. Ferriss and his four hour work week. <laughs> yeah. So so I put it in a can and, and then I kind of did that with a bunch of other sort of supplements, you know, like I like, pro I like, I like to be able to drink protein, but the, all the protein shakes were always tasted horrible or they had a bunch of junk in them. So I made, you know, a, a really good protein that tastes great and all that stuff. So okay. I just, that's just kind of a, a little something that I do. Unfortunately, I, like I said, I'm, I'm probably too particular about things and I only like them the way I like them. And so I end up having to make what I want and put it out there. Well, you know, that's okay. So that takes me to an interesting interesting point here because you are particular. I have been described as that myself. Um, you know, we're about to cross 3 million subscribers on YouTube. We're incredibly grateful for every single viewer yeah. or listener. It means a lot. I, You know, you can either exalt yourself or genuinely feel humbled by people who enjoy the show. And I know your podcast just completely exploded. It's wildly popular. I recommend everybody check it out. But you are particular. I'm kind of that way as well. How do you balance being particular, getting things right, you know, with not being a dick? Well, this is sort of what the new book, The Dichotomy of Leadership, is about. You know, The Dichotomy of Leadership, nicely done, nicely done. <laughs> that is a segue, is what they call it. So, yeah, excellent work, excellent work. I can see why you have so many subscribers. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, also, it's, I also have an incredible sarcasm detector. It's a skill like anything else. But, okay, no, but yes, I, I, it is a genuine question, though. I'm sure you've, it's, you have diff sometimes different types of people, and especially as you lead people, you learn as different personalities they have different inner conflicts. So I'd imagine that's one that people like you, myself, Smooth Manny, share in common, type A personalities. Yeah. So one of the things that I think you got to watch out for is what matters and what doesn't matter. Like if you get wrapped around, if you're particular about things, but you're particular about things that don't matter and you let those things drive you crazy or, or, they, or you let those things drive a, a wedge between you and your team because you want things done a certain particular way and it's things that don't really matter, that's going to be problematic. So for me, I, I think I did a good job and do a decent job of discriminating between what actually matters and what doesn't really matter. And so I'm particular about the things that matter and, and I, the things that don't really matter, hey, I'm going to let them slide and it's not that big of a deal. And yeah, does that take, did that take some effort over the years? Sure. You know, I was a little bit more particular about things that mattered less when I was younger. Now I'm a little older, a little bit more mature. I grew up a little bit. And now I can look at things, ah, you know what, I'm not going to worry about that. But these things over here, I'm going to hold to them. Right. But a Diet Coke, you're not going to let that slide. Diet Coke, Diet Coke is not slide. <laughs> okay, no. okay, all right. I I just, well, we're, just, we're putting the, we're all we're categorizing them. Uh, it's obviously the newest book to the shelves, like you said, Dichotomy of Leadership. W where does it sort of uh, fit in with your other books? So, you know, good, I guess a good question is, why did you feel the need to write this, considering how thorough, uh, you know, uh, Extreme Ownership is? Well, it was pretty thorough. If you remember the last chapter, and I appreciate, you know, you give us a lot of support for Extreme Ownership, and that, that's, that's been great. That's a great book. The, the last chapter of Extreme Ownership is called The Dichotomy of Leadership. 
And, you know, we hit on it. We hit on the fact that as a leader, there are these dichotomies. And, and you and I just talked about one. There's these dichotomies that are pulling you in opposite directions. And you can see, and as we worked with leaders after Extreme Ownership came out, we'd see, and it probably, probably my fault, probably our fault for writing Extreme Ownership and using the title Extreme, because people felt like, oh, we got to be extreme. We got to be an yeah. extreme leader. They'd be like skateboarding now, into their conference, like, whoa, kickflip, and then take their knee out. And you're like, you're 90. Stop. <laughs> this yeah, is an insurance yeah, seminar. Yeah. So, so the extremities in leadership generally aren't that good. So the examples, the clear examples, like as a leader, you have to be aggressive, right? That's kind of be, be your default mode. And you got to step in and make things happen. But at the same time, if you go too far with that, if you're overly aggressive, then you take unnecessary risk and you put your team at unnecessary risk and you put the mission at unnecessary risk. Yeah. So you back off of your aggressiveness. But if you back off too, too much of your aggressiveness, well, then guess what? Now you're not being aggressive enough. Now you're at the whims of whatever the situation is and you're not making anything happen. So that's bad. So where do you want to be? You want to be somewhere in the middle. Another easy one to, to recognize is like a talking, right? A leader has to communicate. A leader has to talk. But can a leader talk too much? Well, absolutely. Yeah. A leader can run their mouth all the time and now people stop listening because they're basically crying wolf about everything that's going on. So that's bad. So you back off communicating so much. Well, if you back off too much, well, now you're not communicating enough. And the folks on the front lines, they don't know what's happening. They don't know what the mission is. They don't know what the goal is. And so that's a problem. So where do you want to be? You want to be balanced somewhere. And again, as we work with leaders, you know, because I got a leadership consulting company called Echelon Front, and we work with all these different companies, all these different teams. And as we work with them, we realize that the biggest problem that leaders have is trying to find that balance. So yeah. that's why we had to write the second book. And, you, you know, of course, the, the first book did well. And so the publishers really wanted us to write a second book really quickly. But, you know, we put uh, three years in between the two books because we wanted to make sure that we had a subject that was going to really hit home and, and teach leaders something that's important. Finding balance. So it's like, Mr. you're kind of like Mr. Miyagi with a buzz cut. <laughs> it's, a little, you know, it's like, find the balance. And then you arm bar them. Let me move on to here another, you talked about your book, Mikey and the Dragons. Is that, is that Mikey and the Dragons? Mikey and the Dragons, yep. And uh, is, it, is this published yet? Is it available? It's not, a, it's not published yet. It comes out in November. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's available on Amazon right now for the pre the big pre order. But now, can you can you you were telling me off air the story with that? Can we talk about that or no? Well, you no, know, it's it's a pretty straightforward story. So I I had an idea for this book, and I actually had one of those moments where it was pretty cool. I woke up in the middle of the night and wrote the first half of the book, and then I read it, and I was like, wow, this is good. And another week later, I I woke up in the middle of the night and I wrote the rest of the book. My, my daughter and my wife woke up in the morning and I said, hey, let me read you something. And they were both, you know, my, my daughter was like, read it again. Who's, she was eight years old at the time. She goes, oh, read it again. And my wife was looking at me like, kind of surprised. She looked at me like, I can't believe you actually wrote that. So, yeah. which I took like a compliment, you know? I mean, she just, <laughs> well, I can't believe guy. your daughter orders you around. So now we know who <laughs> Jack <laughs> submits to. Who wears the oh, pants. Yeah, trust, trust me. <laughs> So, uh, so as I read the book, you know, I, I really liked it. I shared it with a couple of my friends, a couple of my friends' kids, and everyone was just nuts about it. And it, it teaches the kids a, a very important lesson. And so I just wanted to get this thing out. This was in the summertime. I wanted to get this thing published. And publishing is a big, giant, well, the old school publishing is what the old school media is. You know, it's like, what, it's this big, giant machine that works in its own way. And so I went to my publisher and I said, hey, I got this book. You know, I want I want to get this book published by November so people so the kids can have it for Christmas. Let me get it in their hands. It's an important book. And they were like, well, no, we're looking at our cycle and the way things work. And it's a big you know, it's a big bureaucracy and it's a slow moving machine. And they said, we'll get it published next cycle. It's 14 months away. Don't worry about it. It'll do great. And I kind of said, well, no, I really want to get this thing published. Can you, you know, let's, can you help me? Can we, can we make this happen? And, and eventually back and forth, back and forth. And they, they, they were trying to be accommodating, but they just, they just don't have that kind of maneuverability. And finally, they just said to me, there's, their quote was, there's no scenario where this book gets published by November. Okay. And I said, okay, fair enough. So I, you know, hung up the phone and then I started my own publishing company and now the book's coming out. In <laughs> so you quit and then created a spite publishing company. Perfect. Uh, that's a good example of a, of, of a pivot there. Um, and I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you did that because we're, we're actually looking at ho hopefully the change my mind book getting out before Christmas this year. I don't know. I don't know that we can because we have so much work to do, but this was a, initially an idea that I had pitched funny enough back, back to conservative publishers uh, many, many years well, ago. Well, I have a, I have a publishing company. If you need something out by Christmas, let me know. We'll make it happen. It's about us writing it. 
great. That's the issue. Like we have, like <laughs> I have it all written down as far, but, it's, but yeah, it's it's about me. We have hundreds of pages. We we took out a stack actually. Uh, was it two weeks ago of yeah, just yeah. what I had re- what I had written as far as like jokes and sketches this year? And I don't know how many thousands of pages we actually couldn't oh, take it out of the box. Uh, it's about 15, 16 pages every single day, and that's not including the change. My mind is really about research and making sure you go back to your original sources. And the point is, long time ago. I didn't have the name change my mind. I pitched it to a conservative publisher, and it was called American Idiots because at this point Green Day was really popular. And they, you know, I remember I saw them in Canada, and they were chanting "American Idiot," and I remember I was the only American there going "Boo!" in Montreal. <laughs> and uh, so I even remember I designed the cover because they had this hand with a heart and like a grenade. I don't know if you remember, and mine was a brain. Uh, basically, the idea that they'd been lobotomized. And this idea was describing kind of different sort of people whose mind you can change, whose minds you can't change, and identifying the difference. At the time, we didn't have a lot of the terminology we do today. Point is, every single publisher turned it down. They did not like it. They were like, eh, right wing people don't do comedy. You know, if you find like a doomsday book where you can sell some hybrid seeds, you let us know. And then this, I will say it was a small victory. This exact same publisher came up when we were at the White House doing a Change My Mind segment. Really? and said, we want to do a book deal. And I was like, yeah, I bet you do. Um, so we will. You know, Maybe we will be in touch, though. We do need to definitely have someone uh, at least proofreading it because, um, man, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not dyslexic, just dumb. Uh, so let me ask you about this. The, 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 the Dragons book, Mikey and the, I want to say Mikey and the Dragons. Every time it's a white guy name, I could get it wrong, like Matthew and the Dragons. It, it really sort of, um, from what I've read, uh, from what I also have that you've sent to me, it talks about sort of the need to be a hero for, for, for young boys um, and overcoming kind of basic fears. And, and there was a book I read one time called Wild at Heart. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it talks about how every man's sort of young boy needs a damsel to save, a dragon to slay. Um, but it's interesting that you talk about, kind of about overcoming fear. What made you want to write a children's book specifically addressing these issues? Well, the, the primary thing is I have four kids. You know, I have four kids. The oldest one is now 19 years old. She's in college. I got a senior in high school. I got a sophomore in high school, and I got a nine-year-old. Yeah. And so I've seen what what it does to them. I've seen what it does to kids. Kids are kids get scared of things. And there's pretty fundamental principles that you can kind of take action to to overcome your fears. And so that combined with just you know you know again diving into human nature all the time on my podcast and talking about talking about fear as, as a person. And, you know, I had to overcome fear, you know, through my whole life. And, you know, like I was scared of the water when I was a kid, I ended up becoming a seal. Well, that's, that's, that's a good way of overcoming your fear. Yeah. Afraid of heights. Okay. Guess what? I jump out of airplanes. Hey, that's a good way to overcome your fear. A, a good result of overcoming. Your I was going to say, is it a good way? I mean, you don't just throw <laughs> someone out of a plane. You're like, I'm scared of heights. <laughs> Go. <laughs> No, there's actually, there's actually, it's, it's actually ended up, it's called exposure therapy, which is interesting because in my first kid's book, I wrote about the kid who's scared of swimming and scared of the water, scared of swimming. And so his uncle Jake, who's a seal, who's a Navy seal that stays with him for the summer comes and says, Oh, you're scared of the water. Here's what we're going to do. And he takes him first. He brings him and they wade around in the water. Then they dunk their heads in the water. Then they start walking out with their chest deep in the water. And then they start treading water and then swimming and then eventually jumps off the bridge. Yeah. It's and, and and so I put that in my first book, like, and the, where I got that from was my, my middle daughter was wanted to be the star of the school play, but she was scared of, scared of crowds and scared of performing. Yeah. And so I, I said, okay, sing it in front of me. Okay. Sing it in front of me and your mom. Okay. Sing it in front of me and the rest of the family. Okay. Sing it in front of me and the family and the neighbors. And eventually just built it up where she could get on stage and she got the lead in the school play. Well, and so I put, put that around swimming. I'd hope but, you say it a little softer for a girl. It's like, sing it! Sing it! <laughs> Why? <Yeah. laughs> it's because you've been drinking so much white. There's not that much caffeine, but if you have five of them, uh, sing it! Um, but, <laughs> yeah, but so, so when Jordan Peterson was on my podcast, he was talking about how he had somebody overcome the fear of needles by start, you put the needle in the room and then you put the needle in the, in the bookcase and then you put the picture of the needle and they hold the needle and then they touch the needle, blah, blah, blah. Then they started doing heroin. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. It's called exposure therapy. It's called exposure therapy. That's what it's called. It's a real psychological methodology for people to overcome fear. And anyway, so Mikey and the dragon is about being afraid. And guess what? When you're a little kid, you're afraid of everything and you got to learn to overcome these fears. And so in the book, it's actually a book within a book. This kid, the main character, Mikey, he finds a book. He's actually scared of the book because there's pictures of scary looking dragons in it. But he sees in the book also there's a picture of a little kid that kind of looks like he knows what he's doing. And so he decides he's going to read the book. It turns out that the village or the kingdom inside the book, the king has died. 
He was the guy that protected the, the kingdom from the dragons. Now no one wants to face the dragons. The little prince is like left. Everyone's looking at him. You got to face the dragons. He goes to his dad's war chest. He opens it up. He pulls out the sword. The sword's like too big for him. The shield he can barely hold up. And now he's getting even more scared. And then he sees a note at the bottom of the war chest. He pulls it out. It's a note from his dad. And his dad kind of explains to him how he's going to overcome these dragons. And then the rest of the story proceeds. So... So, and then your, and your daughter was the one who really liked this, and you said reread it. And this is what's interesting because we're often told that right they sort of have to be separate the, the, the books for for young boys and books for young girls. And I often say, listen, what's 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 good for helping young men learn how to be proper men is often really good for young women as well. Uh, this is one thing I was interested. In. Can you maybe kind of share some, if you have any sort of techniques or drills that you use to 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 maintain or develop sort of the cognitive skills that you had to develop initially? I mean, you know, this sort of target discrimination that you've talked about in acquisition in the military. Basically, it, it, it sort of translates to better decision making under stress. Are there any specific uh, exercises or techniques that, like, is it, is it lumosity? Is lum, does lumosity work? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think you, maybe you should spend more time on the mosque. You should I, come up with some questions. Um, <laughs> well, I guess, then I guess there are no techniques or drills. I thought I was, I was hoping I was going to learn, you know, be given a grain of wisdom, but okay. All right. It sucks to be me. Yeah. Uh, the story, the story in the book is actually about my oldest daughter who came home from school one day saying, I'm stupid. I'm, I'm dumb. All the other kids are smarter than me. And I, I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I don't know my times table and everyone else knows them. And I said, well, how much have you studied them? And she kind of looked at me like, well, what do you mean study them? I said, well, did you make flashcards? I said, you're not just born knowing the times tables. You have to actually study them. So we made flashcards and, and in an hour she had all the times tables memorized. And so it was my fault as a parent, obviously, because I didn't teach my kid how to study. But that happens with, that happens with kids all the time. It happens with them in sports. It happens with them in school. And what you actually have to do is apply yourself. You're not just going to, you're not just born being able to shoot, you know, foul shots. You have to actually go practice. You're not just born knowing your times tables or knowing Knowing the Gettysburg Address, you actually have to study them. So it's the same thing for me. You know, I was kind of a, a miscreant of a kid, kind of rebellious, didn't study really hard. But then when I got in the military, I said to myself, okay, I want to win at this game. And I realized I had to learn how to study. You have to memorize a bunch of dumb stuff when you're going through like Navy boot camp. Well, how do I do that? I just, I just had to apply myself. And as soon as I started applying myself, I realized, oh, I can actually – I can actually perform well right. as long as I do as long as I do the work. So to your point about making decisions and making stressful decisions, well, what we do in the SEAL teams is we we put people in stressful situations where they learn how to do some things that we talk about in, in extreme ownership and talk about in the dichotomy of leadership. One of the primary things to be able to do is to be able to detach, to be able to take a step back from your emotions and from all that chaos as a leader, take us elevate above the situation and look around and actually make a good assessment, not based on the emotions that you're feeling and not based on the chaos that's right in front of you, yeah. but based on what is actually happening viewed through a logical lens. So, so that's one thing you can do. The it's exceedingly do difficult is, too. It's easier said that it's uh, really, really hard. Yeah. And it's, and it's a huge, if you can do it, if you learn how to do it, 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 it basically gives you this ultimate power because what you can see when you're not engaged is it's just like watching a football game and everyone's watching you. Oh, why don't they just do this? Or that guy should have done that. Well, yeah, you're sitting in the stands or you're watching it on TV from 14 different angles. The person on the field couldn't see that. Well, as a leader, when you step back, it's, it's a huge advantage to be able to detach and really assess things from that from that altitude above right. where all the chaos is happening. Sort of like telling someone what kind of questions they should be asking. But I do think, um, I do, <laughs> see, you get the smile though with Jock, which is nice. We don't yeah. see this so often. You get those pearly whites. Now here's one thing, right? Obviously as I watch you, as I've listened to you, as I've read you, you're a passionate guy, right? That's kind of, that's why people talk, you know, get after if you read the Amazon reviews on the tea, which by the way was delicious. Um, <laughs> people really talk about being aggressive and getting after it and being motivated. Uh, so you're a passionate guy. That's one of your, I think that's what makes you magnetic to a lot of people. But when you detach, right, so you have to look at it entirely logically, do you sometimes feel as though or think that you lose one of your assets, which is your passion, kind of your emotive response, which sometimes is an asset? Uh, because I definitely have struggled with that, especially in comedy. It's like, man, we've got to connect to this emotionally. That's where, you, that's where you draw the comedy. But then at a certain point, you've also got to make sure that you get this joke done in time or this story. Uh, do you sometimes have to say, all right, I need to detach, but I also still have to bring the, the passion that I have and find that balance? See, I'm going to actually give you credit back for your questions again, because what you're talking about is this is this is the dichotomy of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Do you need to detach? Yes, you absolutely need to, to detach. Can you get too detached? Yes, you can. 
I, I don't know if you've how much time you've spent in the workforce in the labor force, but when you go out and you see a boss that's like an emotionless person, he just he's making decisions based on the spreadsheet, doesn't communicate, doesn't interact with people. Nobody wants to follow that person. They lack emotions. Now, so so you can't be on that end of the spectrum. And, and you're right, I couldn't either. Like I, you you have to show your emotions because if you show no emotions whatsoever, you're a robot and people don't follow robots. The other end of the spectrum, if you're a guy that flies off the handle and can't control your emotions, well, then people think, hey, if this guy can't control his own emotions, how's he going to control all the situation that's happening? So where do you want to be? You want to be balanced somewhere in the middle. And you have to kind of modulate that. And, and you know, here's another a, a funny technique that I talk about is, you know, if, if you come to me and you're my employee and you come to me and you're all mad about something, you're, you're flying off the handle. Hey, I can't believe this happened. I can't believe this order came in. This is ridiculous. So what, what I need you to do is to attach, right? The worst thing I could do is show no emotion whatsoever. The worst thing I could do is say, hey, Steven, you need to calm down, right? Yeah. All that's going to do is make you more inflamed. So what I do is I, I actually, I'm going to reflect your emotion, but I'm going to diminish it. So yeah. I'm not going to be as mad as you are, but I want to be on your team. If I say, hey, you need to calm down and figure out what's going on, all of a sudden I'm not on your team. Like we're, we're, we're antagonistic now. And you're mad at me just about because I'm telling you to calm down. What are you telling me to calm down? This is ridiculous that this happened. So what I need to do is say, oh, Steve, are you serious? That's what happened? Okay, you know what? We need to figure out what's going on down there. In the meantime, what can we do to get this thing resolved right now? So I joined your team. I brought you onto my team. We connected because, as you pointed out, I showed enough emotions for you to realize that, hey, Jocko is on my side. We're together. We're a team. And now we're going to face the dragons together and go get this problem solved. And that, you know, that really translates to marriage. You know, I went to marriage council with my wife and I always recommend that people do uh, the terms they used was mirroring. And then uh, and d either it was uh, def they said diffuse the situation. So mirror and diffuse or mirror and deescalate. Right. So that used to happen where because I, I, I did have a temper problem for a long time and then I made sure I got it under under control. My wife would be really upset about something and I would make sure to not fly off the handle. And she felt like she wasn't being listened to. So I was like, oh, OK, I, so you just well, you just want old Stephen, ah, you know, throwing a kiwi through a wall that actually happened. And then you're like, OK, well, let's scale it back a little bit. Um, so, you know, that's a, a, a question. that's interesting. What would you recommend to sort of uh, an actually comes from our animator uh, and editor here, Smooth Manny, to newly married couples. Uh, what big or main piece of advice would you give Would you give to them? Would it be the same thing, kind of communicating and, and, and mirroring? Yeah, I mean, de-escalate is, is the huge word that you, and we use that in the military too. You know, if you're dealing with a, a crowd scenario, you know, we'd be over in Iraq and there'd be civilians there. Civilians can start getting antsy. They can start getting aggressive. Yeah. And you can escalate it if you, if you show them that back or you can de-escalate it and let them know, hey, you know, we're, we're firm, but, you know, this isn't a problem. So de-escalation is a huge part of it. And, and to what you just said, again, you're doing great. How, how, do, you, how do you do that, though? Really quick for people like are there's some steps. So someone might say, OK, de-escalation, but how do I do it? Is it OK, match mirroring the emotion and then offering a solution Are those kind of the first two steps? Yeah, well, to your point, you don't want to mirror the exact emotion. So if your wife is, is screaming and yelling, you don't want to scream and yell back at her. What you want to do is you want to show her enough like concern and emotion yourself, but at the same time, start ratcheting it, it down so that she'll match you, and then you can take it a little bit lower and a little bit lower until you've got a calm situation where you can actually communicate intelligently. And yeah. you know, it's the same thing. You, you know, if you're dealing with civilians that are getting rowdy, well, if you just start punching people or, or you know, striking them with a baton, that, that, that what's going to happen? They're going to resist more. In, in many cases, they're going to resist more. And then you now you have escalated the situation. And it turns bad for everyone. Whereas if you, hey, hey, you know what? Can you back off? And you, you try and communicate with people. You try and show them that you're a human being. You know, we would have Arabic speakers with us that we would say, hey, tell them to calm down. Or we, you know, we'd learn a little bit of Arabic so we could at least say, hey, it's okay. We're not going to be here long. We're leaving in a minute. Hey, sorry about, you know, so, sorry we're here. Just that kind of thing. Yeah. Just to de-escalate them. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's opening up communications and, and talking. For the, the question about newlyweds and marriage, I mean, first of all, take ownership, right? When you, the minute you start blaming your your spouse for whatever, you're gonna lose. You're, you're like that's not a good situation. So take ownership of what the problems are, and then figure out what you can do to get them fixed. That's number one. Number two, stay balanced. What what you just described. Don't be the guy that flies off the handle, but don't be the guy that has no emotions. You want to be balanced. You want to be somewhere in the middle. You want to pay attention to what your spouse is saying, so that you can kind of mirror it without overreacting and getting crazy. Yeah. So those are those are two 
good points for for marriage. And I, you know, I've been married for for twenty one years in a in a job that has a divorce rate of about ninety percent. So, so not she must that. be something special to lock down a, a stud muffin like you for twenty one years. Either that, or she's got you know her own issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're both the only ones who would take each other. Let me ask you this: I know you usually avoid, and this is again from from Manny, uh, anything that's sort of uh, divisive or or, or uh, political often. But do you worry today uh, having so many kids? You're a virile man, by the way. I'll give you that. Um, so many kids raised in a generation where n not only the First Amendment, but the, the, the Second Amendment rights you know, are, are eroding, as you're writing these books. Does that, ever, does that ever occur to you? Do you ever get worried about uh, what kind of world they'll grow up in? I would say, do I worry about the way, the, the world that they'll grow up in? Yeah. I mean, I definitely look at some of the erosion of some of these rights that – and but here's the thing. And I got asked this by, by Ben Shapiro the other day. You know, he he said, hey, on a team, we were talking about leadership. He says, on a team, isn't it, don't you need to have a common cause? And I said, yeah, of course you need to have a common cause. And he said, do you think we have a common cause here in America? And I said, well, yeah, I think, you know, people in America, generally, they want to have, you know, they want to have a good economy. They want to do a good job. And, you know, he came back and said, you know, I, I don't know if I'm just more pessimistic than you, but I don't know. He said, I don't think we have a common, like a common cause in America anymore. I think there's people that want something completely different than what I want. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I said to him was, I, I, you know, and I mean, he's kind of like you. I guess you guys are in the same uh, space as far as just being inundated with with the extremes, right? The extremists on the left are just coming at you all the time. And what I told him was, I, listen, you hear that stuff all day long. I said I work with companies all over America, in 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 every city in America, in towns in America. And the normal people in America, they're not, that's not the way those, the way the, the extreme left and the extreme right, those people aren't normal. They're not the majority. Are they the loudest? Without a question, they're the loudest people. Uh, but do, are they the ones that are going to take over? No, they're not going to take over. And there's a, a big, I mean, the vast majority of Americans are, they, what do they want to do? They want to have a good economy. They want to do a good job. They want to build a business. They want to take care of their kids. They want their kids to have a better future than them. They want to own a house. That's what they want. Yeah. And so, and, and when these extremists on either side really truly start to infringe on the normal people in America, the normal people in America aren't going to stand for it. They're, yeah. they're, they'd say, hey, look, you want to sit over there and run your mouth on this side or run your mouth on this side, whatever. We're, you know, we're over here. We're, you know what we're doing? We're actually working is what we're doing. We're in the middle of like going to a job and going to our kid's game. And that's what we're doing. That's what most of America – most of America is not going to protest. And, and most of America is not like sitting online, you know, sending tweets to, to bother, you know, Stephen Crowder. That's not what they're doing. No. Most people Though I am on the people. ISIS kill list. So that's uh, – I found out it's a very long list now. I'm sure you know. It doesn't really mean anything. Like, uh, almost, but then the FBI – like, there's, but then there's a separate list that's – like, you're on that too. So, you know, we'll oh, keep – <laughs> You made like the top. The yes, top yes, I've made the top. When you when you paint Muhammad as Bob Ross in a parody, you, you, they don't have a lot of tolerance for it. Um, no, I th I think you're right. But we were only I think with Heller D.C. either one or two votes away uh, on the Supreme Court from losing private firearm ownership. Period. So it is sometimes it's a very very thin line. Um, so I, I would agree with with Ben in the sense that uh, I agree with what you're saying. Most Americans are not represented necessarily in the media. That being said, when I look at an entire political platform, and I come from Canada, right? So we actually had Mike Ward here. He's uh, been fined and people have been put in jail for speech in Canada. And this is the only place where it exists, the United States. Freedom of speech doesn't exist anywhere else. It can go away really quickly. Um, and, and that's one thing that really uh, concerns me, you know, obviously for future generations. But um, I'm sure your kids will, will do fine. Let me go back to, oh, sorry, did you have something you were about to say? Well, just, just, just where we started out this conversation, for me, like there's things that matter and there's things that don't matter. There's lots of little things that don't matter. And there is a fine line between, you know, in, in the political environment that we live in, there's a lot of people that are barking and jumping up and down, whatever that I don't care about and I'm not going to sit there and bark and play the games with them. But, you know, clearly there are, there are things that are important that do matter. I mean, the first amendment, the second amendment, I mean, those constitutional rights that we have, obviously they're, they're hugely important to me. And I, as we, if those lines ever get crossed, then it's going to be like, okay, well, we're not going to allow that. Like, right. the, like we won't, we're not going to stand for that. Um, and I think that's the way the vast majority of Americans feel. Yeah, I do think that's the, the way the majority of Americans feel. Unfortunately, sometimes it's not necessarily represented. Um, let me ask you this. What 
for you, I would imagine discipline uh, is a little bit different than for a lot of people. And I've learned this kind of managing different people. I am hyperly organized. I'm up early uh, by nature. That's kind of how I am, which is not very typical of someone who's a comic kind of in the creative realm. So I'm a bit of a dichotomy. But for you, I would imagine uh, discipline to me, discipline is something that's hard. Discipline is doing something consistently, even if you don't want to do it once the excitement is worn off, right? So for you, discipline probably working out isn't as hard, I would imagine, as being disciplined about rest, being disciplined about you know not getting, like we talked about, uh, overly jazzed about something, learning to detach. W- would you say that's kind of a discipline and a skill that is more difficult for you? And, and, and how, do you, how do you hone that in? Because that's something I've always, I've always struggled with is, not overdoing it, not burning out. Well, for me, I think it's pretty obvious when I'm when I'm getting smoked, which I can do to myself. I mean, I can get to a point where, <laughs> like, I'm working all the time, and when I know that I've kind of when I'm done, like when I get on airplanes, I get so much work done because I either get work done or I sleep. But when I get on airplanes, I, I usually get work done because. I don't get the, uh, the Wi-Fi, so I can just write or I can just work. I can prepare to do a podcast. I can read something for a podcast. And I'm, I travel a lot, so this is pretty common. And when I know that I'm smoked is when I get on an airplane and I've got you know a four-hour, five-hour flight, and my mind is just going, you just need to just not do anything. And so you know what I do? I mean this happened to me you know, probably five or six months ago. I got on board and I watched uh, Zoolander. That's fine. I thought you were, I, when you started, I thought you were about to say Xanadu, and I was like, he's gay, but Zoolander's fine. Yeah. So, and, and I sat there and watched Mugatu and, and, and had a good laugh. But yeah, the, why did I do that? Well, it's because at that point I realized, okay, your, your brain is just toast right now. You don't feel like doing this. And, 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 and this is coming from someone, normally when my brain says you don't feel like doing this, I'm like, oh, okay, really? Really? that's pathetic and I'm going to crush you because you even had that thought in your brain. Yeah. But when I hear that, you know, since I wrote about my book, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual, like when you don't want to do something, that's fine. Don't do it, but don't do it tomorrow. So like, oh, I don't feel like working out today. Cool. I don't feel like working out today. I'm still going to work out. If I still don't feel like working out tomorrow, then I won't work out. Right. And that's kind of way the way I am with everything. Like writing, you know, I've I written a bunch of books. In order to write a book, you got to sit down in front of a, a computer and you got to type words, which is not exactly fun. No. So there's a lot of days where I go, oh, you know what? I can just put it off till tomorrow. No, I won't. I, I'm going to do it today. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to make it happen. And then if I really need a break and I still need a break tomorrow, then I'll take a break. But right now, I'm going to get it done. You can't negotiate with, you know, the terrorist in your brain that's trying to tell you to be weak. That's, you know, that's a really good point. I actually just had this conversation with my wife yesterday, you know, the old Churchill quote, you, you can't uh, uh, rash, uh, what was it? You can't negotiate with a, a tiger when your head is in its mouth. Um, yeah. And, and you want being able to make the decision to take a break, I think is what's important as opposed to basically being brought to your knees. Uh, See, so funny you mentioned movies for me. I can't watch a film because I'm watching, I'm analyzing the shot placement. I'm looking at the lenses and I'm going, oh, okay, I see what they did here. I see the writing. I see the timing and the pacing. So I just try and shut off on a plane. But how funny would it be if you got in a plane and wrote a whole book? And it was on Google Docs, and because you didn't have the Wi-Fi, it was totally gone. It'd be t- it'd be t- <laughs> not good. I've, that would not be funny at all, actually, Mr. Comedian. It was funny to me. It happened to me, and everyone here had a huge laugh. It wasn't a full book, but it was, you know, it was, it was 15 pages or so. Uh, yeah, be, be, be very leery of the Google Docs if you're not on the Wi-Fi. I think uh, that's, that's really helpful advice, and I, I appreciate it. That's something that... Uh, a lot of people struggle with. A lot of people struggle with in training. A lot of people struggle with is 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 burnout. And uh, I always, when I talk with people, a lot of young people, I go, you know what? This advice isn't for you yet. It's kind of like black with jujitsu. It's like, you know what? You're you're not at the point where you need to worry about overtraining. You know, you need to worry about getting your basics down first. But once you reach a certain point, it's uh, it becomes even more of a concern. Okay, the website is. I want to make sure I got this right. JockoPodcast.com. Uh, the dichotomy of leadership, of leadership is the newest book. Amazon. Uh, is there anywhere else where people should be looking for it? Yeah. Well, the, the dichotomy is available everywhere. You know, uh, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, wherever you buy books, that's available. Yeah, Barnes and Noble. Though they should have. They should have quit a long time ago. There's a Barnes and Noble around here. That's a Barnes and Noble cafe. They don't even have any books, so that that tells you where paperback is going. Uh, and then uh, the other book you said you can pre-order on Amazon is Mikey and the Dragons, right? 
Mike and the Dragons. Mike and the Dragons. All right, thank you so much, Doug. I appreciate you coming back. Really enjoyed the tea, actually. I'm going to ask Manny for uh, some more of that. And uh, hope to have you back soon, man. Hey there, YouTube viewer. This is about the point of the video where I would tell you if you like this video to subscribe. Only that doesn't mean anything anymore because it doesn't necessarily appear in your subscription feed. So this is about the point where, you know, I would tell you to hit the notification bell, but that doesn't mean anything anymore because you hit it and nothing happens. So the only option you have is to join Mug Club at lighterwithcredit.com slash mug club. That way we don't lose contact with you or at least bookmark this YouTube page. But I'm pretty sure that Google will find a way to screw with your bookmarks and switch it to Samantha B and CNN. So just join Mug Club unless you want us to go away. And of course, all the Bangladeshi children who will die as a result because they help us with developing uh, costs.